So what do you think of the method? <laughs> Ah, here. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. venture out in the snow? <laughs> uh, yeah, I spent like an hour and a half shoveling this morning, and mm -hmm. when I look outside, I, I could probably do another 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't risk it. Yeah. Laura, it says that you're muted. Okay. Hello. Hey, Laura, that would be better, because I don't I have headphones. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm going to hear her. Yeah. So I could have been from class, I could have been from Yeah. 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 You didn't want to. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. What does it say about me? I, I can't hear. Okay. Uh, Laura, it says that you were muted, but you're not anymore. And um, okay. <laughs> we, can't, we can't see you, but that's fine. We don't need. We don't need to see you. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. I promise. It sounds like Catherine is in the background. Yeah, yeah she is. Yeah. <laughs> my computer is broken, and so I I'm think we're gonna. I think we're gonna oh, just use my, the computer. My camera's not even on. Oh, it's confusing. It's okay. Does it like just switch between the faces as you're talking? Yeah, make... talking. yeah it should switch, but I think I can make it so that um, I think I can make it so that I can control who gets shown. Here, let me say. We yeah, turn off. I think what I can do is I can just turn off everybody's video, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then it will only show me for video. Mm -hmm. I'm in the control room right now. Um, uh, so there, it's it says right now that there's one viewer. Um, so the viewer that uh, what I did is I sent everybody an invite to be guests, and only at, I I figured this out in my last class. Only guests can actually talk. Everybody else just watches, <laughs> except that I made a Q&A feature. I, like, enabled that so you can, like, ask questions by, like, typing them in. Oh, so okay. if you are a viewer, then you can only communicate through text, and otherwise you can talk. And um, I sent everybody invites to at least their, um, their Vassar email address. Mm -hmm. um, but some of you I sent multiple invites because, you know, you were in my class before and you've sent me email from Gmail. So uh, <laughs> because of that, I was able to get you in a different way. Uh, oh, okay. Frank. Ah, a bunch of you are, oh, you're actually in the class, I see. <laughs> and then uh, Lays is back there. <laughs> How many other people are in the room? Too funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. I'm going to go grab a whiteboard. Okay. Yes. Uh, what? Yeah, I'm not really going to be in the lab. It's like five or something. Yeah. Because it's like not. It's fine. I got to <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to get out today anyway. I know. To the snow. <laughs> Hello. 
We still have three more minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, James, you're at your dorm. It looks like you are connected and yep. you're politely muting yourself, but you're there. Yep. And you can hear fine, you can see fine? Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, my face is... Wait a second. Sound? Hold up. I'm oh. gonna. I can hear us. No, I mean my computer. Guys, <laughs> 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 it's all working now. Oh, are you well, guys gonna project it on the board? That's a good idea. <laughs> we could use someone else's computer to actually talk to him. Yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> There has been speakers. We definitely, there, because remember before, before the hackathon, hackathon, when we did You guys are trying to turn on the, the sound for the projector? For the podium? Yeah. Right now. Yeah. I'm talking. Can you hear me? Through the sound system? That's a good view. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Or if you people on the spot. One thing that I can do is I can mute the project, the one that's doing the projecting. That way, um, I'll always pick up sound that's closer to who's ever talking. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so okay. now that now that one's muted. Cool. Uh, so should we start? Everyone feel like it's gonna work? <laughs> can uh can everyone try saying something? Isabella, can you say something? Hi. <laughs> okay, I can hear you. Uh, Liz, can you say something? What? <laughs> okay, Sorry. I heard you. I heard you. Uh, Catherine, can you say something? Hi. And Frank? Test. Oh. And Laura? One. <laughs> <laughs> and then a um, uh, new person who is in uh, biology, I believe. Is that is that right? Biology or chemistry? Okay. What's your name again? I'm trying to remember. They're chatting. I heard you say here, but I didn't hear what you said. Oh, it's Derek. Derek. Ah, it's Derek. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Derek. All right, good. Okay, uh, now if I click this, you can all see me. Well, you can see, like, you know, the infin infinite projection. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, if I click this, That's like if I click cool. this, then you can see me. Okay, and this is this is my blue board. <laughs> Let me just test that you can see something. Um. Is that readable or is it backwards? No. <laughs> it has like the reflection of the computer in it, and it's. And now. Yeah. Is that okay? 
No, it's bad. Because yeah. Google Hangout switches the screens between the people who are talking and, yeah. That's how it does it. Did you click something, Jay? It said that you weren't presenting anymore. Oh, it says I'm not presenting anymore? Here you go. That happens. Oh, that's that's new, new floor. I think it's oh. new if you talk. Yeah, yeah I'm just talking. Oh, wait, but then he can't hear me because Frank's computer is currently listening to me. Yeah. And that's why right now it's technically me who's talking. Okay. But I could have sworn that I muted the microphone. I'll just do that again. <laughs> um, is, I, I, actually, I actually muted your microphone. Um, now I clicked on the button that says I am presenting to everyone, and I think that means that it will never change. Yeah. Okay. Can you Can you read this, or should I not use this? I could also try to, like, you know, open like a picture on my computer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. This is fine. Works for me. It's pretty legible. Okay. Uh, if it doesn't work, we'll open up a picture. Oh, I forgot my sponge. Hold on. Let me go grab my sponge. <laughs> that is a bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Does that surprise anyone? Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to see his daughters. His daughters are really cute. Show us your family. family. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just. <laughs> 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 All right, I am back with my sponge. Now I can erase. Okay. All right, I'm going to get started now. Sound good? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So today we'll be talking about uh, numbers on computers. So, so that's, the, that's the idea, numbers on computers. So uh, to start off with, let's talk about the basics of um, of making numbers. So at the simplest level, the way that we can think about numbers is on our fingers, right? Uh, so um, you know, if we want to think about a number like three, we do one, two, three. This is what kids learn how to do, right? So on our fingers, that's a unary number. So a unary number, we typically write down like this. So SS0 for the successor of the successor of 0, uh, which would be 2. Um, in essence, uh, a unary number is like tallying, is like tallying marks up. Now, it would be really easy to do math um, on unary numbers like this. However, uh, unary numbers like this are inefficient in terms of space, and they're ineff inefficient in terms of time. So what essentially what we'll be trying to do in this lecture is going through a bunch of different representations of numbers, going from the obvious ones up to what computers actually do, thinking about how efficient they are. So if we had unary numbers like this, where we have the tally, and we can think of the tally as encoding a recursive data structure like this, as representing some number, how much space does it take to store any particular number? If the number is n, how big would the amount of space that would be end up being? Um, I can't really change. I can't really make it so I can see. Um, actually, can I present to you but see me? Ah, oh, look at that. Okay, I've made it so that I can see you, but I'm presenting my screen, so someone could like raise their hand or just jump in and say, you know, I know what the size would be. Does it? Does this question make sense? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, me, let me make another one. <laughs> So here we have 4. We've, we've tallied 4. We have SSSS0. 
and then that's 4. So this is another way of writing down, you know, a number, right? So mm -hmm. in general, how big is the representation, meaning the way we write it down, compared to the size of the number? It's n plus 1. <laughs> yeah, it's n plus 1. So if you, if you're going to write down the number n, then if you're going to write down the number n, then you'll have n tick marks, um, which will have n, um, you know, s's, and then one zero at the end. Um, I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> and then that, of course, corresponds to the number n. So this is kind of like the most basic way to write down numbers. And um, that sort of tells us that the worst case scenario for representing a number will be linear, meaning that there will be as many pieces of information as the size of the number, uh, or rather as the magnitude of the number. Um, so clearly, computers do not do this, because this is very inefficient. Um, but we can talk about what they really do. So what do they really do? Let me just hold this up with my nose for a sec while I open up my Wait. notes. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> what computers really do is they represent them in binary. So you have probably had a lot of practice writing down numbers in binary. Does anyone have a favorite uh, four-digit binary number? No. <laughs> 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 I like 101101. Um, like one, one. Actually, that's not four digits, so I guess I'll go with 0110. Zero, one, zero. That's a fun one. So if we have 0110, um, one, zero, what number is this? Six. It's six. And the reason it's six is we can think of it as just being like decimal, <clears throat> where to the right is 2 to the 0, next is 2 to the 1, then 2 to the 2, and 2 to the 3, which is, of course, um, 1, 2, 4, and 6. Or sorry, 1, 2, 4, and 8. <clears throat> so, you know, when you're writing down numbers in decimal, you have the 1's place, the 10's place, the 100's place. Well, binary numbers have the 1's place, the two's place, the four's place, and the eight's place. So this number is one, two, and one, four, so that makes a six. So this representation right here, how big is it compared to the size of the number? Right away, we can tell that we can store six in less than six pieces of information. So we know that it's not linear. So what is the size of a number? How many, how many bits do you need to store a number like, you know, 73 or any, any given number? <coughs> a lot of people know that the answer is going to be the logarithm, that mm -hmm. you can store the number n with log n bits, but the explanation for why may be more complicated. So the explanation for why is, is that <clears throat> if you have some number n, then that means it, ha it has to be less than or equal to 2 to the m. Right? Every number n is less than 2 to the m for some m. <clears throat> and similarly, it's larger than some other to, to the, let's say, um, Q. So every number n is between two powers of n. Sorry, two powers of 2. Now, 
it turns out that every number is, um, if it's less, sorry, if it's just barely greater than Q, um, sorry, let me say this another way. There is a unique M such that the number is less than 2 to the M, but greater than 2 to the M minus 1 for all numbers. Can anyone think of an example? Like, what's that number for, for, um, for 6? So 6 is less than 2 to the 3, because that's 8, and it's greater than 2 to the 4. Sorry, 2 to the 2, which is 4. So that means that the number m is 3, because it's, greater, it's less than 2 to the m, and it's um, greater than 2 to the m minus 1. So that means that this number m that has this property... this number m that has this property, uh, is how many bits you need to be able to store this number. And m is always log n. So it's really, it's always the ceiling of log n, because log n may be, um, you know, maybe like have decimals and stuff like that, you know, it may be a fraction. Um, but the ceiling of it is always m. Is that believable? Can you see it up? Yes. Okay. So that's why you need um, you need a logarithmic number of bits. Now this is a very good thing um, because that's really small, which is good. Uh, Laura says question mark. Can you move the board? We can't see the bottom line. Oh, you can't see the bottom line. Is that yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the so th so I've sort of motivated this in terms of the size of this number that it's logarithmic rather than linear. Um, but you know, could we do better than this? Could we represent numbers as smaller than a logarithmic number of their bits? And right here, we're doing the logarithm base 2. Is there a way that we could store them in, like, the logarithm base 3 or base 5 or something like that? Why do, why do we use 2 in this example? Binary? Sorry, I, 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 I heard Leia say something, but I couldn't make out what she said. Because it's binary. It's zeros and ones. It's yeah, but, why, but why, why is it binary? So, yes, you're totally right. But the answer is that it's binary. But, like, why do we have binary? So let me just show you an example. On my fingers, I can count in unary, but I can also count in binary, because I can do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <laughs> 6, 7. See, you can count in binary, right? But I can also count in ternary, because I can do, I can do like, I can put my, my finger like halfway out. Because I can do like, well, this is 1, and then that's 2, and then this is 3 halfway out, and then that's 4 with this one halfway out, that's 5 with this one all the way out, then this one's 6 with it all the way out. See, because like, cause our fingers have the two digits, like the, the, the knuckle, you can count in ternary on your hands. So why didn't we come up with ternary rather than binary? Electrical signals? Yeah. yeah, electrical signals, exactly. Because we have positive and negative charges, and we and it's easy to have electrical devices on and off. When we master quantum particles, we'll be able to have a different encoding system because, like, elementary particles have more than one dimension of properties. Like, they can have their spin, and, um, like, because there can be, 
like counterclockwise spin and clockwise spin, but their spin is independent from, I think it's called their color. Is, is any particle physicist yeah. in the room? Well, the color is has to do with how they're bound together, I think. Yeah, well, I forget exactly what it is. But basically, if the universe gave us more independent variables like this, independent dimensions, then we could build other numeric systems that would be better than binary. But right now, because all we understand are, are you know, uh, electromagnetism, uh, that's what we use. Okay? Now, the other thing that about binary um, is uh, that we can do operations on it um, on a digit-by-digit -digit basis, meaning that the operations on it are also logarithmic. So let's do a little example. <clears throat> so you know, when you're a kid and you add, um, you know, 11 plus 13, when you add 11 plus 13, you add the ones place, and then you add the tens place, and you get the combined answer, right? So we can we can add by column. We can do the same thing with binary numbers too where if we had, you know, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 0, 1, then we can add those numbers um, as well. Ooh, I've got an idea. Let me turn it on the brightness really low on my computer. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> It just makes it harder for me to see where I'm pointing, but I think it'll work okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so we've got these numbers right here, and we can add them as well because we can start on the right, and so we can add 0 and 1 and get a 1, and then we can add 1 and 0 and get a 1. So let me write that. So 1, 1. Now we have the 1 and the 1, which when we add, we have a 0 and then a carry, just like you do when you're in grade school. And then a 1 and a 1 gets a 0 with a carry. And then we have the 1 down. So the operation that we did, we were able to add two numbers together. Um, and we added them by position. And there are a logarithmic number of positions. And we only had to do one operation per position, meaning that this was efficient because we had a logarithmic number of things. So both the time and the space for operations like addition are logarithmic. Now there are some special properties of the binary, binary numbers. Like it's really easy to multiply by two. Uh, Jack, you gotta keep that closed because you just drew on the on the bed. So stop, stop what you're doing. Sorry, my, my son is messing around. No. Okay. All right. Sorry. So, yeah, so <clears throat> it's efficient to add these numbers up. Um, but notice something interesting that happened. So there's two things interesting that happened. One is, is that we needed an additional bit of memory for doing the carry. That also meant that we can't add them all simultaneously. Right? If we tried to add them all simultaneously, we wouldn't know that there was supposed to be a carry here. You, have to re you really do have to add them in order. That means that um, even with parallel processing, we can't add numbers faster than log n. Finally, notice that the numbers that went in were four digits, but the number that came out was five digits. See that? That has a really important consequence, which is the first big thing that you know, the, the first practical thing that we'll talk about in terms of numbers on computers. And that's that you, of course, know the numbers in your programs are all different sizes. So, for instance, characters, the char type in, in um, you know, Java and C and stuff like that, is 8 bits long, meaning that it is always exactly 8 digits long. Now, many of those digits might be 0, but it's always exactly 8 long. And a short number is 16, and an int is 32, and a long is 64. 
And then there's also long longs on some architectures, which are 128. So what's the consequence of doing that, of having a limit on the size of the number? I thought I heard someone say something, but... Um... Did someone say something and I didn't hear? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what did they say? They said have so many numbers if you know. Yeah, there's a limit on how many numbers you can have. Um, whereas, like the operations on unary numbers and on decimals. And on um, and on binaries, like the, when we think about them, we think about them as having no limit. But putting a cap on them means that they do have a limit. And we can represent that limit mathematically by saying that we're doing operations modulo the size. So, for instance, on a computer, when you do n plus m, you're really doing that mod two to the 32. So look right here. <coughs> so whenever you do an addition operation on integers, you're not really adding n and m. You're adding n and m modulo 2 to the 32. You got to stay out of the way, honey. 2 to the 32. So it's not so much... So in, in one way to look at this, is, is that there's a limit to the number of numbers, mainly that you can't have numbers larger than 2 to the 32. But another way to look at that is that you're simply not working with the addition operation you think you're working with. You know, in the program you write down plus and you think that that is plus, but it really isn't plus. It's something else. It's plus modulo this. So this has huge consequences for, um, no, honey, no, put that away. Sorry. Um, this has huge consequences for writing numeric computations, which is, of course, kind of the theme of the class, right? How do we represent math in the computers and do it efficiently and, you know, usefully? So what are some consequences of having this modulo operation? Uh, when n, when n and m get too big, there's a wraparound. Yeah, when n and m are very large, there's a wraparound. So let's use a smaller example. If we had mod 2 to the 3, which is 8, and we did, um, you know, 4 plus 4, please close that. Can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So <clears throat> 4 and 4 both fit in 3 bits. Um, but when we add them, the answer doesn't fit in 3 bits. So we would end up getting 0. Now, do you guys know what, uh, what CPUs do to help you deal with this? So what CPUs do and what programs do are not the same thing. So there might not be a way to deal with this in Java or C, but there it may be possible to... Libby, could you take her out of here? Um, it, but it may be possible to do it with what the CPU provides. So what would you want to know in the case that you added 4 and 4 and you got 0? Well, could you have, like, a counter for the number of times that mod 8 was... We like reset it back to zero. Okay, so you want to know how many? So first of all, um, you went kind of above and beyond because the first thing you want to know is you want to know that it that it um, that it wrapped around. But you said, well, what about the situations where it wraps around multiple times? So in this case, it wrapped around one time, and so you want to know whether that happened. So what does the wrap around correspond to? 
um, and what we're familiar with. Think back to when we did the positional addition um, with the binary numbers and when you do positional addition with you know, decimals. Is there anything like a wraparound? It was, is there ever a time when you're adding and you get a smaller number? Uh, the carry. Yeah, that's what the carry is. The carry is the wraparound. So when you're, you know, uh, an elementary school kid and you do 6 plus 6 and you get 12, you, what you really did is you got a 2 and then you noticed that there was one wraparound. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. So is it ever possible to add two numbers and get more than one wraparound? <laughs> so are there two... Ten, are there two one-digit numbers in decimal that you can add to and get, you know, 20? No. No. So that tells us that if the computer only provides addition, there's no reason for there to be any other than a single bit of information that a carry happened. But of course, we know that the, compile, that the, per, that the processors also provide multiplication, right? And with multiplication, you can get a very large number of carries. You know, if we take 9 times 9, then we can get, uh, you know, 81, so there were 8 carries. Uh, unfortunately, processors do not provide the number of overlaps. They only provide that there was a carry. So even though it's possible for there to have been multiple carries when you're doing multiplication, they don't provide this. And... Most programming languages don't tell you that this happened either. Um, should we talk about why they don't do that? Sure. <laughs> 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 Every I can watch everyone slowly look at each other. Should I should I say yes or no? Uh, so <clears throat> the problem with uh, with noticing that there's a carry is that when you notice that there's a carry, that means that you had a, a line of program like right here, and then another, another line, and then another line. And this line right here is going to look and see if this line had a carry. That means that this line can't be moved up. Um, because if it moves up, then the carry will be the carry for this line, not the carry for that one. Because unfortunately, the processors give you the carry information in a global variable. Um, and since they give it to you in a global variable, um, only one of them is valid at any time. And so um, programming languages are typically, well, old ones, are typically optimized for, um, for being able to have maximal code movement so that they can have lots of optimizations done on them. Uh, and so that inhibits the, you know, looking at the carry information, inhibits the ability to do this. So they don't typically provide that, which really stinks. Um, occasionally, you can put your processor into a mode where it will throw an exception every time that there's a carry. Um, but doing that is very expensive, and so it's not often done. Is there any way to detect if there was a carry without the processor telling you for addition? If the number you get back is smaller than, uh, n never mind. <laughs> no, you're on the right track. So if you add, so, sorry, someone was going to say something? What was that, Catherine? Like you could check the inequality or quality of the memory used before and after the operation is being. Okay, so if I have if I'm adding n and m and I get back some number, I can compare it to both of them. And what would I be looking for? If it's bigger. Yeah, we want it to be bigger than both of them. If there was a carry, then it will be smaller than one of them. It's not it will never be smaller than both of them. Sorry, it will always be it will always be bigger than one of them. Is that true? No, that's not true. But if it's smaller than either of them, then you know um, that there was a carry. 
it's it can be yeah yeah it's not it's not necessarily going to be smaller than yeah no, never mind I'm just babbling okay <clears throat> so that would be one way to detect it for addition of positive numbers is there a way to detect it for um, addition of positive and negative numbers? Because, of course, one thing that's uh, annoying is that we also have the ability to add negative numbers, right? Uh, did, you got, did you all learn about uh, two's complement addition? Do you know what two's no. complement means? No. That's when you, is that when you flip the bits or no? Yeah, that's when you flip the bits. So, basically... Um, where, uh, where, so one way you can think about, um, okay, so uh, let me start off. So we've always been assuming so far in this conversation that we're dealing with naturals, <coughs> meaning positive integers. But of course, uh, we often use um, negative numbers too. So one way to store negative numbers is to just have a, um, a single bit at the front that says, I'm positive or negative. So, for instance, if we had four-bit numbers, uh, does anyone know what four-bit numbers are called? Four-bit numbers? <laughs> yeah, they, have a, they have a cute name. Byte? No, they're called nibbles. A byte is, a, a byte is an eight-bit number. But a four-bit one is called a nibble. <laughs> I'm just writing an example down. So one way to do this is to take the four-bit number and say that there is an additional, sorry, the, the four-bit number, and say we're only going to use three bits for the size of the number, and we'll use one bit for its sign. So right here, we would say that 0, 0, 1, 1 would be positive 3, and here the single bit at the front is saying, is it, pos is it negative? And so when it's 1, it would be negative, because the 1 stands for it is negative. Now, doing this um, is consistent, but um, it makes it hard to do addition. Uh, so what happens when you try to add these numbers together? We know that we want the answer to be 0, right? Because when you add 3 and negative 3, you should get 0. When we add these, however, we'll get something different. So we will have a carry, and then another carry, and then no carry. Actually, there'll be a carry, and then a 1 and a carry, and then a 1. <clears throat> Which means that when you add these, add these numbers, you would get positive 6. Do you see that? Sorry, you would get negative 6. Because yeah. 1 and 1 become 0 with a carry. 1, 1, 1 would be 1 and a carry. And then 1 plus 0 plus 0 would be 1. And then 0 plus 1 would be 1. And that is the negative bit is set. And then the 4 and the 2, so we get negative 6. So that would this um, is annoying. This, is, this would totally... One way you could say is that if you choose this representation of numbers, then you just can't do addition like this. You have to do you have to detect when the signs are different and do something different, which is okay. Um, but uh, most processors are much faster than that, and they do the same operation. And they do that by representing negative three differently, and they do it by flipping the bits. So what they do is they say this right here this one at the bottom, is um, negative 3. Um, because it's just like 3, but the bits are flipped. So 
3 was 0, 0, 1, 1, so that means negative 3 is 1, 1, 0, 0. You can't see it. Okay. So the positive number is 0, 0, 1, 1. The negative number is 1, 1, 0, 0. So what happens when we add that to positive 3? Let's see if I can do this upside down. So 1 and 1 is 1. 1, sorry, 1 and 0 is 1. 1 and 0 is 1. 0 and 1 is 1. And 0 and 1 is 1. So we get all 1s. Now, whenever we have all 1s, that means that there's a 1 at the end, which means it's negative. And then these numbers should be read as if they were flipped. So it's 0, 0, 0, so we get negative 0. And by convention, we ignore the sign on 0. So notice that doing the naive way to add these, the positive 3 and the negative 3, we got 0 as the answer. Isn't that cool? You can't see again. Is that better? Yep. Okay, let me lift it up. The problem now is I'm lifting it up so I can't see the screen. Can you see it now? So isn't that cute? So this is called twos complement addition, and it's the standard way to represent negative numbers. I'm a little confused on exactly how you flip the bits. Is anyone else confused? Yeah. Yeah. Like how did you get how did you come up with negative three in another way? So you flipped zero and one, but then you also changed another one to zero. Like how did that work? Um, so look, so up here we have positive three. And so it's 0, 0, 1, 1, reading from the right. And so negative 3, we just flip all the bits so the zeros become 1s and the 1s become zeros. So we end up with 1, 1, 0, 0. So we follow a, a, a consistent rule, which is that you just flip everything. Let me erase the, um, the, the old example of the, of the not normal way to do it. Uh, I feel like I just said the same thing. Did I clarify anything, Catherine? Uh, yes. I get how you flip the bits now, but how does one 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 equal zero? Ah, uh, yes. So the sign at the at the bottom, the last one, is the negative sign. Okay. So that means that because it's negative, we read these to figure out what its magnitude is, as if they were flipped. Um, so if it's like with the negative 3, we read the last bit to figure out its sign, and we saw that it was 1, which means it's negative. Then we read these numbers with their bits flipped to figure out the magnitude. So we had a 1, 1, 0, which is 3. That means that this number we're going to read with its bits flipped to figure out the magnitude. So when we flip the bits, we get 0, 0, 0, which is magnitude 0. Okay. So notice that this gives us negative 0. Uh, typically, um, you don't actually have two representations of zero. You just have one. Um, so you would never actually get something that's all ones. Um, but, uh, but later on, we'll talk about how floating point numbers have negative zero, um, which is weird. Okay? All right. <coughs> so... What this tells us, oh yeah, so now that we have the negative numbers, is there, some, is there any way to detect whether or not a carry happened with negative numbers? Because obviously negative numbers have the same property, that you just have a smaller range. You know, with, um, with four-bit positive numbers, you can represent anything from zero to two to the four minus one. Whereas with the negative ones, you can represent you can represent from 2 to the 3 minus 1 negative and from 2 to the 3. So basically there is a range that you can represent. Um, so there are still some numbers that would go outside of that. So, but how could you detect? The less than is going to be harder is, is what I'm getting at.
the thing that's going to happen is is that the carry bit for um, for positive numbers is the sine bit. Because if you add up two positive numbers and they overflow, then they'll overflow into the sine bit, because it's the last one. Meaning that there would be an overflow when you had two positive numbers and you added them and got a negative number. Does, is that believable? Okay. Now, negative numbers have the same property, that when you add them and there's an overflow, you end up with a positive number. But is there any way that... Is, is it possible to have an overflow with a negative and a positive number? I don't think so. Yeah, it's not possible. Um... Because the largest a negative number could be would be the largest negative one, and the largest positive one is the same. So if they're, if they're at the boundaries of the size, you add them and you get zero. That means that even with negative and positive numbers, you can detect overflow. Even if the program, even if the, the CPU did, wouldn't provide that for you, you would be able to. Now, in all these cases, we can't detect how many times multiplication would overflow but we can do it for addition and subtraction. Isn't that cool? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so now, um, my guess is, is that when you are programming, you never think about this. Is that an, is that an accurate assumption? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what, what do you think that means, that you never think about that? We code less efficiently. Uh, no, you probably you. It actually is more inefficient to care about it. <laughs> so you're coding efficiently. It's just that you're writing programs that are wrong. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so if you don't realize that when you add numbers, you can get a smaller number, then that means that you are probably making inaccurate assumptions about what the program means. Like, you might think that the program represents some physical thing in reality, but it doesn't. Because the physical thing in reality doesn't have that property. So let's just take a few examples. Um, so you have a simulation of uh, a car, and you want to keep track of where it is on a track. And so you're adding its velocity over and over and over again to its position. What can happen if you don't pay attention to overflow? It could go back. It could get, end up in the wrong spot. Yeah, it, it will end up in the wrong spot. It'll actually go backwards. It'll, it'll be going along, and then all of a sudden it'll warp down to the bottom of the track, the beginning of the track. Because what'll happen is... It starts off in some position, and you add the velocity, you add the velocity, you add the velocity, and then eventually you've added the velocity so many times that its position is at the limit of the, the, of the track, of, or rather of the bit width. Now when you add it, now the bit width goes back down to zero, and so its position is now at the bottom. Can anyone think of simulations like this that behave that way? A lot of classic video games do this, where if you go to the right side of the screen, you'll pop up on the left, or if you go on the top, you'll pop up on the bottom. They were not doing this to be cute. That was actually an error that was uh, <laughs> that, that people realized was fun. You know, basically, like what you're just observe you're just observing overflow inside of memory, um, and you know. It doesn't matter because a simulation isn't important. But in a, a physical simulation, it would be very important to get this right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
So, <clears throat> given this problem, um, how could we represent numbers more efficiently? Sorry, how could we how could we just never have to deal with overflow at all? Like, is it possible to build a computer that doesn't have overflowing numbers? So put, put that another way. You know, we talked before about why do we have binary? We have binary because of, you know, electronics, right? So why do we have 4, 8, 16, 32, 16? Why do we have numbers that are a certain size? I'm going to draw a little picture while you mold this over. Nobody? A lot of basic computers looked like this. <clears throat> and to a, first, to a first abstraction, this is what modern computers look like also. You have RAM, which is just data, and you have CP the CPU, which is just operations on data except that it has a, a tiny little bit of information. It has the register A, B, X, and Y, and then what's called the PC. The PC is a number that tells it what memory to, um, to look at for the program. And then these other four numbers, R, A, R, B, R, X, and R, Y, are numbers that are stored inside of the... Um, of the metal that I mean, the silicon that's in there, um, and you know, in old old computers, like they were individual vacuum tubes. Um, by the way, like before we had electronic, before we had um, like uh, silicone the way that we have now, gates and stuff like that, we had what are called um, vacuum tubes. So you should go look at one of these things. They're humongous. They basically store one bit. Um, <clears throat> anyways. So what this means is, is that that CPU right there, it actually doesn't have access to, you know, 8 kilobytes of memory or, you know, 8 gigabytes like my laptop does. What it really has access to is it has access to five, five numbers. And everything my computer does, it actually does to these five numbers. But it does it to those five numbers in a way that it communicates back with the numbers out here where sometimes the PC can tell it to take RX and spit it out. And it can spit it out in such a way that it, the RAM, which is a totally separate computer, reads it. Well, when I say separate computer, it's really a separate piece of electronics that then stores that RX. And it may come back in later some other time as an RA. So what this means is that the CPU is totally finite, meaning that there is nothing of a variable size happens inside of the CPU. The CPU is always exactly, you know, 200 bits of information and never any more. It's never 190 bits of information. It's never 240 bits. It's always exactly 200 bits. And that's basically how all computers work, and they've worked that way for a very, very long time. And so inside of the computer there's a spot, like a, you could point at it. It's, nowadays you need a microscope, but in the old times you could just point at it and you'd say, that is where addition happens on the CPU. And you'd be pointing at a little black box, and that little black box would only have 16 pins going into it and 16 pins coming out. Or actually, it would have 16 pins going in and it would have like 9 pins going out. It would have 8 coming in for the left number, eight coming in for the right number, and then have eight coming out for the 
the output, and then one going out for whether there is a carry. And that actual box would only have that many wires coming out of it, and all addition that happened happened inside of that black box. Am I making my point clear, or am I being too laborious? Frank's looking around, taking notes. What do you think, Frank? Am I being too laborious? <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> so anyways, so... <laughs> <laughs> so because of that, uh, the only way we know how to make computers is to give them this finite amount of stuff that they're doing. So that means that we can make the size bigger but there's no way to make the hardware do an arbitrary amount of stuff. There's no way to say, sometimes add 7-bit numbers and sometimes add 277-bit numbers. Anytime we want to have a variable size of numbers, we have to do it ourselves inside of the software. The hardware won't do it for us. So what are some ideas that you have about how to make it so that your scientific program never runs out of bits. Where runs out of bits is, you know, think about the race, the uh, car simulation. You know, how do we make a car simulation that doesn't use the plus that comes with the CPU so that it never runs out of numbers? We can go back to the numbers that we talked about at the beginning, the, the unary numbers on our fingers, right? Okay. Like, we could create a data structure inside of our Java program called a number, and there was, it was an interface, interface number, and there was a class called zero and a class called add one. And we could go and we could implement everything in terms of those numbers, right? That would work, but it would be very, very bad. It'd be super, super slow because it would be linear in the number, in the magnitude of the number. We could make that more efficient by having the classes be 0 and 1 and have them be, or 0, 1, and no bits and use a binary number. And so we could have like a Java class that corresponded to binary numbers. Can anyone think of an even more efficient way to do that? Do, do, do those two ideas make sense, by the way? Let's have Loris answer, because I know that I, she doesn't mind me picking on her. <laughs> Could you explain it a little bit better? <laughs> sure. So we could make a class. Um, do you think it would be useful to share my screen and like type in some Java code? Yeah. Okay, let me type in my Java. Do this. It's funny to change my background and see that you guys have uh, more brightness in your room. <laughs> do you mind if I write it in Racket? Or should I do Java? Java. Java would be nice. <laughs> All right, sorry. All right. <laughs> sorry. I'm going to define an interface called Unary and a class called no fingers that implements unary. And no fingers has no pieces. And you know I could write a um, I could write a function called add that takes a unary number and adds them. And then I could write one finger implements unary. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then we can say unary add unary right. 
And we could do return um, rest dot add right. Then we can put that inside of a new one finger. So this right here implements unary addition as Java classes, where you have a new no fingers. Let me do unary add unary right up here, where no fingers corresponds to when I have no fingers up, and one finger corresponds to when I have only one f well one finger up and then some more. And so these two classes work together to implement numbers. And there is no limit to the size of these numbers, uh, except the size of all of memory, right? Because I could, I could keep allocating these until I ran out of memory in my Java program. I really want to switch so I can see your faces to see, like, is, is, does anybody get this? But then if I do that, then, I won't, then you won't be able to see the screen. <laughs> you know, the Emacs. So you gotta tell me. Does this make sense? Yeah. Does anyone want me to explain it differently? I'm gonna do the binary numbers next. <clears throat> All right, let me do the binary ones. For binary, we would have a very similar interface. So there would be binary, binary, and binary. And you would have something that was like no fingers, but it would be called no bits. And it would implement binary and no bits, binary and binary. Then you'd also have a one bit that implements binary, one bit and it would have something called binary rest. Binary rest. We'd have this dot rest equals rest. Now how can we add these together? So, hmm, this is kind of a strange way to think about it, because we normally think about adding them positionally. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, actually, Let's actually think, let's, let's, let's do it differently. Um, we could also say that a binary number is a list of bit. Um, right? Uh, and I don't have to write a list class, do I? I'm all familiar with a bit, uh, that. And then the bit class, you know, there would be, um, you know, an interface for bit. There would be a class for the one bit, implements bit. Um, and then there would be the zero bit. Um, and then the addition function on binary numbers, so we'll have a class called binary that has some, you know, functions implemented for it. So we do, you know, static uh, binary add binary left and binary right. And how could we actually add them up? So if you think about an example like this, how do we add these two numbers up? Um, oh, first of all, uh, let's say that the numbers are read from smallest to largest. So normally we write the smallest on the right over here, like this would be the smallest and this would be the largest. But it's easier to add them when we store them the opposite direction. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to extend this one to be the same size. So we could do something like, you know, int size or, you know, width equals the maximum of the left length and the right length. And that tells us how long each one should be. And then we could say, you know, extended left would be, you know, left dot extend to that width. And basically that just means like add some zeros afterwards. Then what we could do is um, we could add them. We could add them with a carry. So add with carry, and we'd start off the carry as being false—that there is no carry. 
Yeah, yeah. By the way, these bits are really just booleans. So I guess we could really just think of it as a list of boolean num of booleans. So how do you add with a kit? So and, and this is just we just want to return this. So like, how do you add with a carry? You basically say, so you have, you know, x, y, and the carry bit. I'll write this in pseudocode. That there are two cases. There's the case where you have a 0 and more x, and a 0 and more y, and the carry. And so that equals the carry bit. Um, on to, you know, add with carry of x, y, and false. Okay. And then we're going to have each of the other possibilities. So we have um, this is 0, 1, this is 0, 1, 1, and 1. And so here, um, Because there's a 1 there, we want to think about each, whether the carry is 0 or 1. Okay. So if we have a 0, a 1, and a 0, then that means that we want 1. And there's no carry again. And here we have a 1 and a 1, so we have a 0 with the carry being true. And in this case, we have to think about the 0 version and the 1 version. And they're exactly the opposite of up here. Or actually, no, they're the same. Sorry. So we have the 1 and the 0 with this being a true. And then down here, um, we have whatever carry is is what the answer is. And the carry here is always true. Isn't that beautifully symmetric? So this function right here implements carrying with addition. And then um, you know you have the last case, which is just there's this. Uh, and if it's false, then you just have it be empty. And otherwise, you have it be you know, 1 onto nothing. So this code right here is a way of doing addition using lists, where the lists are list of the digits. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I get yeah. the idea. OK. Um, obviously, that would be very tedious to write the whole thing out in Java, but it's sort of this is the core idea that, you know, this add with carry takes in two lists, so it's going to look at the first two, the first, the element of, the first element of each and see what they are. Um, now, this is very inefficient, though. Why is it very inefficient? Let me go back so I can see you all. It's inefficient because it stores, like, the only... It, it's basically redoing what the hardware does. Because the hardware is doing its own addition that's just like this, but it's using actual, you know, electronics rather than storing these data structures and doing, like, pattern matching and stuff. So we can make this faster by letting the hardware do the hardware part and us do the arbitrary precision part. Essentially, what this code does is it implements a CPU with, um, one, with one bit numbers where you have 0 or 1. We could change this so that the numbers were numbers with 2 to the 32 possibilities. Where you could store the number. This is binary. We could have class 32-ary. And the only difference would be that rather than having a list of zeros or ones, we'd have a list of, you could have like 77 plus something else, and you could have another one that was, that was like 99. And you could have 
the number that would go here would be any number. Let me just do some ASCII art. These numbers right here could be anything that fit inside of what the processor could do. And then the carry would still be a Boolean. Isn't that some beautiful ASCII art? <laughs> yes. So doing this, you could follow the exact same pattern of doing, um, you know, grade school addition, but you could do it not on zeros and ones or things that were, you know, zero through nine. You could do it on the entire range of numbers that your CPU provides. And you could go through this process and go and implement every single operation on numbers. And then you would now have numbers that never um, uh, that like never ran out of space. They just got as the as the size of the number got bigger. Sorry, as the magnitude got bigger, the number of bits dedicated to it would also get bigger. Does that make sense? Would you believe me that the languages you use already do this? Some of them, at least. So Racket already does this. That's why, you know, when you're writing a Racket program, the numbers can get super, super big without you thinking about it. In Java, when you use the big int class, that is one of these numbers. So in Java, I'm still on the, the phone. I'm almost done. Um, so yeah, so in Java, the the class that's like 32 area is called big int, and they're already built in, and so using this is one way um, to avoid the overflow problem and still do all the integer operations that you want, except that the big ints that are built into Java um, are very, very clever uh, in a lot of different things. So some of the things that they're very clever on is they don't actually have lists of digits. They have giant arrays um, of digits of certain sizes. So basically they'll store, you know, two 32-bit numbers, and then they'll store four, and then they'll store eight, and then they'll store them in chunks of eight. And so they have very smart data representations. The other thing is that they do really bizarre um, algorithms for doing stuff like addition and subtraction, or addition and division. Hold on, let me um, let me switch this Daddy. to turn off screen sharing. <laughs> I'm knocking you off. Right. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so, so for, for instance, um, like the way that you do multiplication um, when you're a kid is uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's like n log n, sorry, it's, it's, it's like log n, but you're looking up things in the giant table. And so it's kind of like um, it's kind of like m cubed times log n, because the table that you're looking it up in, that you have memorized, is m bits wide and m bits tall, and so it's um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And so you're you're sort of like looking up in this giant table. Uh, but the division operation that you do uh, is cubic. So, like, the naive way to do long division is n squared. Um, but there's this way to do long division 
that's very hard to describe. That uh, here, let me write down what its performance is. Could I play something Marvel? I finished my my daddy's school bag. Could I do it? All right. So, <laughs> do you see this? So, the normal way to do division is n squared, but there's an algorithm um, that uh, this guy Strassen worked on that runs in n log n times log log n time. So it may be hard to appreciate that, but that is a lot faster than n squared. Um, and that's the way that the, the big ints in Java do it. And, you know, the big ints in um, Racket and stuff like that do it, too. So anyway, so my point in this is, is that the idea of creating... Jack, you got to leave. I want to tell you something. I only have seven more minutes. you got to leave me alone. Sorry, guys. <coughs> Um, so, uh, <laughs> trying to get where I was. So yeah, so the the idea of doing arbitrary precision, um, sorry, arbitrary uh, arbitrary size numbers, um, is sort of based on the most simple ways of doing numbers, but trying to leverage what the computer is good at and what we're good at, and then recreating that in software. And it's very wise to do this um, when you know that you're going to be dealing with large numbers. Um, and it's also good to sort of have it as a backup um, for all your programs when you know that the, that the numeric part isn't really important. So for instance, um, so let me think of an example. So a good example would be like YouTube. You all know Gognum style? Mm-hmm. Do you know what happened with Gangnam Style over uh, over Thanksgiving? Oh, didn't it break the YouTube counter or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The counter, like, on YouTube, uh, they store the their numbers. It's like, I knocked over zero or whatever, and it only had, like, a thousand views, so they would change the code to, like... Better reflect what's going on. Right. Yeah, so they uh, they overflowed what they their, the size that they stored. So that's a good example of like overflow affecting people in the real world. You know, this uh, great piece of art, Gognon style, was almost lost to time by having you know the number of counts <laughs> you know decremented past that where maybe no one would know about it anymore. Um, but that's not something where the performance. Uh, downside of using the arbitrary precision would really matter. And so because it doesn't really matter, um, that's something where the people who wrote it probably should have used a big int to begin with, because then they would have never had this problem. Um, whereas in other situations where we're incredibly worried about the performance, maybe we want to guarantee that it stays within a certain bit width. Um, and we'll want to deal with the consequences of that some other way, such as detecting carrying. So I hope that we've sort of given a, a framework for thinking about these kinds of low-level issues about how these numeric operations really happen. Um, and today we talked about the integers. And next time we'll talk about rationals. So rationals being you know, numbers like you know, 4.5 and stuff like that. Because implementing rationals and implementing integers in some ways is very similar, but in some ways is very, very different. So that'll be the subject of next time. And you know, in the process of talking about rationals, that's of course where floating points come in, because floating points are an approximation of rationals. Sound good? Yeah. Um, do you think that this uh, this virtual thing worked okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'd rather not. I'd rather yeah. not. This is in a room, yeah. like. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not uh, it's not preferable, but uh, I think that it's probably better than just a video, right? Right. Right, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, well, um, hopefully we won't have so many snow days. This is crazy how much snow there is.
Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, yeah. So uh, I guess I'll see you all on Thursday. Okay, yeah. okay bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank <clears throat> you.